Okay, um, welcome back. I hope everybody made it back. Did you have a nice break? You're going to need it. I do too, so we're all going to need this to get through. Um, so uh, the exam uh, is scheduled for uh, Thursday, but unfortunately I'm going to have to move it to Tuesday. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm So we're, we're studying this type of coating mechanism, just a little bit, and we're at the cell membrane coming off the cell surface. This actually buds into a vesicle, which is not shown here, uh, becomes uh, an endosome and infuses with the early endosome right there. So what are, what are the details? We talked about that we need uh, some sort of adapter protein, assembly particle, and we need uh, a GTPase, which is ARF. And so we need to put all these pieces together to solve this complex problem. And if you're not, if you don't think it's complicated, uh, this is the number of proteins that interact just to pull something off the cell surface. Um, obviously, we don't need to memorize all these different components, but I do want to give you a, um, a feeling for how complicated this is. So one of the, the first things that actually has to bind to the plasma membrane to initiate this process, to recognize cargo, to start the coding process, is this assembly particle number two. And it's specifically to pull things off the plasma membrane into a plasma coat. Now, AP1 is used to actually take things off the Trans-Golgi network, and so we'll, we'll talk about that later. But it's a very specific assembly particle, and assembly particle, because it's got several different components to it, uh, basically, it, these two proteins are the hub of what's called an interactome of all these proteins that have to interact with it. And so we'll, I'll try to simplify it by um, putting just the minimal number of connections that you need to make the clathrin protein. Uh, now notice this, uh, we're gonna, we'll be talking about, uh, this is heat shock protein 70. Don't be confused, it's spelled HSC by the British. We use HSP for heat shock protein. So it's the same thing, heat shock, heat, heat shock protein. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so um, we have all these proteins that, and one of the things that does initiate is this uh, AP2 particle. And what it's going to do, and we're, 
this diagram is good, so I show it because it has all the pieces, but it's actually at the Transgolgi network. That's why this is called AP1 here. So it's interchangeable with AP2 uh, because it has the same types of components. So you've got some sort of cargo, and this is a cargo receptor, actually, and so it's going to bind some, uh, actually, in this case, it's a, 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 a lysosomal enzyme. It's the cargo. Uh, but the cargo binds to this. It changes the conformation of this cargo receptor. And that change in conformation is detected by a couple of different proteins. Uh, number one is ARF. And ARF is the one we talked about last time. It is a GTPase, a small GTPase. Um, and so that means it needs a gap to break down G GTP, and it needs a GEF. So it's going to run into its GEF, and that, that part is not shown here. But what's really cool about this protein is ARF has a retractable landing here. So when it's in the GDP state, it's off, and it's cytoplasmic. So it's soluble in cytoplasmic. When it encounters its GEF, usually on the target membrane, which in this case, this, is, this would be the, the trans-Golgi network, um, it binds that protein and it gives up GDP, it picks up GTP, and that causes it to go into an active form. What it does is it lowers its landing gear. Now, the landing gear is a amphipathic helix. So it's just like um, prostaglandin H2 synthase, it actually kneels into the cytoplasmic leaflet. Okay? And that's what's wrong with this picture. That's, this is actually a pretty good drawing of the proteins, but the problem is that's a transmembrane something, right? So that's not the actual, it shouldn't be drawn like that. It should be a single amphipathic helix, and so it's only going to insert into the cytoplasmic leaflet. But it's a lipid anchored protein. It's an integral, it's not li lipid anchored, but it's, it's um, um, one of those integral membrane proteins, although it's a fairly loose association, because this thing has to come on and off. And what ARF is going to do is recruit Mickey Mouse over here. Now, this is, this is the assembly particle. Uh, it's AP1 here, AP2 with the plasma membrane. And it has these two little appendages that are called ear domains, because it does look like Mickey Mouse a little bit. And so this is a complicated assembly particle that's going to recruit different pieces. So ARF is going to recruit AP1 to the plasma membrane, and it's AP1 that recognizes the cargo receptor. So it's going to detect what it has to endocytose or to, to bud into a vesicle coming off the trans network. Okay. So it's got several different uh, pieces, and here's a close-up of its diagram. And so it has an alpha subunit, and it has an alpha appendage. So this is all one subunit right here. The little ear domain and the little the alpha domain here, these are both part of the same subunit. There's a beta-2 domain, and there's a beta-2 appendage, okay? Um, there's a mu-2 subunit, and a sigma-2. So all of these have <coughs> roles to play in this, this um, complicated story. So what this hinge domain, this appendage domain, looks for is ARF. That's number one. The appendage of, alpha, of the uh, alpha subunit binds to ARF. So that's, this is how Mickey, that little ear here, is going to associate with ARF. So that's binding component number one. The appendage also recognizes phosphatidylinositol 4 5 bisphosphate, which is a nice simple name called PIP2. And let's see if we have a, a picture. Let's go find, yeah, okay. So here, this is a, a standard uh, uh, phosphoglyceride, except this, in this case, the head group is inositol. Anositol, could you close it? Uh, anositol head group is used in signaling and vesicular trafficking. It's a very specific head group. Okay? And it's mainly found, almost exclusively found, in the cytoplasmic leaflet because that's where the, the Mickey Mouse ear is going to detect it. So it has to be, in order for it to be detected, it has to be phosphorylated at the 4 and the 5 position. Okay. And that's going to give it a very, so there's all these kinases, lipid kinases, that regulate the phosphorylation state of this gizmo here. And this is like a, a, a key that locks into a protein. And so this, this is a very specific shape. Let's see if I, yeah, there we go. So the different phosphorylations on that head group recruit different proteins. So one of the proteins that's being recruited is Mickey Mouse. 
That is this appendage right here. So this appendage is binding to ARF, and it's actually binding to the cytoplasmic leaflet directly. Okay. So it's a peripheral membrane protein in that sense. And what type would it be? If it's binding directly to the fossil lipids, what kind of peripheral membrane protein does that make it? Direct or indirect? It's direct, right? Okay. But it's also bound to, by this structure, it's also bound to ARF, which is, which is a lipid anchor, or not lipid anchor, but it's an integral membrane protein. So it's actually holding on via two methods. ARF and directly onto the lipid membrane. Okay, so the second thing that happens is um, so this is holding on to that appendage, and the the mu two is the, the subunit that recognizes the cargo receptor. So this is going to actually this mu two is going to pick up this thing right here. It's going to bind. So that's what making just lies on top of it. And the mu2 binds to the cargo receptor. And then whatever the cargo is stuck to it is going to be taken out of that compartment, which in this case is the transology network, and butted into a vesicle. So we're starting to build a clathrin code here. And if, the cla if you can get clathrin to polymerize, you'll create a butted vesicle and it'll come off. Okay. So Mickey is recruiting the, um, the cargo receptor for the mu subunit. You still need to rec recruit clathrin, and that's where the beta-2 comes in. The beta-2 appendage recruits the heavy chain of clathrin. So you're starting to see how this integrates the whole picture. It's being recruited by ARF. It's recruiting the cargo receptor by this thing. The beta subunit is then holding on to the clathrin and causing it to start to polymerize. That's what causes the bud to form, is the clathrin polymerization. Now, what is this sigma for? It's a structural component that stabilizes all the other pieces. So this really is a, a major hub that interacts with lipids, uh, transmembrane protein. What's the transmembrane protein that it's interacting with? You'll look at this. The cargo receptor. Okay. That's the, it's got a single pass out of helix that is exposed on the cytoplasmic domain. So that's the that's the transmembrane protein. And then what's holding on the clathrin? The beta 2 subunit. Okay. Now, where does the heat shock protein come in? So this buds into, let's see if we have a picture of that. Buds into a clathrin coated vesicle. Oh, this, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. So this buds into a clathrin coated vesicle. And as you know, what, what happens is that clathrin has got to uncoat. So how do you uncoat a clathrin coated vesicle? Let's go back and see if I have a picture of that. It may be in a previous lecture. Yeah, here we go. Shows it pretty good. Okay, so something has to cause this to uncoat. And what happens is it's actually ARF that initiates this process. So when ARF splits GTP, so it's, it's GAT activity is turned on, or the, uh, some sort of GAT protein has to turn on its GTPase activity. What it's going to do is, is uh, ARF will split GTP, it goes back to the GTP state, and it retracts its landing gear, because that's the rule. Bound to GDP, ARF re removes its landing gear. It deploys its landing gear when it's bound to GTP. So if we split GTP, then ARF is going to retract its landing gear and leave this little grouping. And then things start to fall apart. What happens is calcium, it causes a conformational change, and calcium in the cytoplasm will actually bind to the clathrin light chain. You've been wondering what the clathrin light chain is for, right? The heavy chain holds on to the assembly particle. The light chain binds calcium, alters the conformation of the clathrin molecule, and attracts heat shock protein 70. Heat shock protein 70 then joins this, this little crew right here and unpeels the clathrin coat off of the vesicle. All of that's detailed, by the way, in your outline. So you can, you can walk through it. OK, so this is a long process that starts with there's got to be some cargo loaded onto the cargo receptor. There has to be ARF 
recruited to plasma membrane. It then has to recruit the uh, AP1, AP2, depending on where it is. It recognizes the cargo receptor, uh, recruits platform, forms the vesicle, uh, turns into what, what actually cuts it off here? You remember what there's a protein that cuts it off? Diamond. Diamond. And it's, it's a GTP as well. So it's splitting GTP. Um, Interesting, the heat shock protein, all these heat shock proteins are ATP. So it's splitting ATP to help peel the clathrin coat off that vesicle. Why, did it, why does it have to uncoat the vesicle? Why not just leave it on there for protection and good looks? Well, it's headed to some it's, it's intracellular compartment, right? So it's not going to be able to, that's correct, it's not going to be able to bind to the target uh, compartment if it hasn't lost its coat. That's because it's got all this machinery that we're going to talk about next that's directing the fusion with the target membrane. So this is just getting started. This is budding a vesicle, creating a vesicle. Then once we form this vesicle, it's got to go somewhere. How does it know where to go? Well, it's got all this nice information in the form of proteins and also in the form of the different lipids that's in the membrane itself. And that's why we go back to this diagram here. Different membrane lipids recruit different membrane proteins. That makes sense. Okay. And depending on where you are and where you're going, the phosphorylation state of the lipids changes. This is a really new active area in membrane trafficking. Let's look at what has to happen and how complicated this is. We'll take a really simple message. We're going to come off the cell membrane right here, form this vesicle, and fuse with this compartment right here. To be able to do this, look what has to happen. So when it's, uh, remember the way you form a, a, a platform coated vesicle of the plasma membrane is AP2 binds to phosphatyl and osetol 4,5-bisphosphate, which is nicknamed PIP2. This is PIP2 in the blue. So only regions of, of the plasma membrane that have PIP2 can form a plasma membrane. All right? So when it forms this when it forms the, and this unpeels, it becomes an endosome. Okay? And this endosomic uh, vesicle is now gray. Look at the, there, here's the key. So this is gray, or is that green? Yeah. Okay. Is this gray or is that gray? Um, uh, green. Is that, is that green? Oh, that's green. Okay, this is gray, right? Yeah. So it's got four or five. What it has to do to, to go transform from this to this state is it has to add a phosphate in the three position. So let's go back and look at the key. Okay. Here we were. This is the state of the, the lipid membrane that was recognized by AP2. Okay. It was pulled off the plasma membrane, and then there had to be a kinase that phosphorylated it in the, five, the uh, three position, okay? Because it was four or five, you added it to the three position. So let's go back here. So what we're doing is we're starting out with the phosphate here and here, and then we're adding the phosphate there, okay? So all of that stuff to form just that early, that uh, endosomal vesicle, okay? So we've, we've formed it now. And then to, to fuse with what's called the early endosome, sort of a, a way station to get all the endosomes coming from the plasma membrane, this has to turn green, not literally, okay? But what has to happen is it needs to have just a phosphate at the free position. So what's going to have to happen to this guy? You have to have lipid phosphatases chop off four or five. Right. So this gets really complicated, and the point is not to memorize all these steps. But understanding that the lipid membrane itself is helping to direct the vesicle where it's going to go. That's just the first step. And how does a lipid membrane do that? Because depending on the phosphorylation state, you're going to recruit different proteins. And these guys ultimately determine whether it fuses with what compartment. Okay. Yeah. So would it be safe to say that the um, kinases or the phosphatases rather than the different phosphatidyl and nosotols themselves are localized in the different compartments? They're, uh, they're actually, they tend to be in the cytoplasmic compartments because they have to sort of mediate the, they're always in the cytoplasmic compartment because their, their target, their, their substrate is the cytoplasmic lipid. And as you're going to see, what 
Those enzymes are called, we're called RAB effectors, and we're going to get to RAB here in a moment. So we, we have dozens and dozens of these things that have to interact to get this thing to go to the right place. So I'm just trying to give you uh, a sense of the complexity. All right, so lipids are involved, proteins are involved. Okay. Now, so we've talked about this, this step here, and what we want to do now is go to a different type of, of, of coding mechanism. It's look at the similarities and differences, okay? So we've, we've done platform coding. Uh, we're going to jump over here to, to COP2. Now, COP2 is nice and simple. You use COP2 in order to butt off a cocoa-containing vesicle from the ER if you want to go to the Golgi. You're just going next door to the Golgi, okay? So what kind of cargo would go from the ER to the Golgi? Well, everything that's going to be secreted. Everything that's going to go in the Golgi has to butt off from the ER first. All the membranes that are going to go to the rest of the organelles have to start here in the ER. So there's a lot of traffic that's using a COP2 coding mechanism. Okay, so it's an important mechanism, and it's going to go to this sac of the Golgi. We're going to look at the Golgi several times today. But this, this sac is called the Cis-Golgi network. It has a very bubbly-looking surface because it's got lots of vesicles fusing with it. That's why it looks bubbly. Okay. All right, so how do you how do you build this compared to a clathrin coat? Right, it's different. Okay, so guess what? You need a GKPase to start it off. Just like R, just like R, except this one's called SAR. Okay. And the same rule applies. If it's bound in GDP, it's soluble in the cytosol. It's got its landing gear retracted, and its landing gear is an amphipathic helix. That is <coughs> Part of it is lipophilic, and part of it is hy part of it's hydrophobic, and part of it's hydrophilic. So the part facing outwards of that alpha helix is, lip is um, hydrophobic. The part that sits into this membrane, kneels into it, uh, is embedded in the cytoplasmic leaflet, is hydrophobic. Okay. How do you re how do you deploy the landing gear? Same way you did with ARF. You bind to GDP and you lose GDP. You have to have another protein to help you do that. And that's always called a GEF, as you know. The GEF for SAR is called SEC12. So this is a transmembrane protein. And so in this case, we know exactly what the GEF is for SAR1. And so it bumps into this green protein, okay, and it, it loses GDP, picks up GDP, deploys its landing gear, and sticks in the, in the, the surface of the ER. Cytoplasmic surface. So now we've got this there. So guess what it's going to do? It's going to recruit the coding mechanism. In this case, it's, it's got different binding partners. Uh, recall, what does this mean if it has the word sec in front of it? What does that mean? Pardon me? <coughs> Yeah, it was discovered in yeast. That they, it's a secretory mutant in yeast. In yeast. And this is so fundamentally conserved that it's the same mechanism in you and I as it is in a yeast. So it's pretty conservative. Okay. All right, so what is SAR1 going to recruit? It's going to recruit this protein. It's a heterodimer. It's called SEC2324 because it was discovered in yeast. Okay. And the SEC23 is the, com the component that binds to SAR1. This is going to start to form the lattice because this is not all, this is like clapper. It's part of the code, right? So the SEC23 binds to SAR1, and its binding partner, this is the heterodimer, SEC24 recognizes the cargo receptor. <coughs> so this is, the cargo receptors have to have one important characteristic. They have to have at least one transmembrane on the so that they have a cytoplasmic domain and they have a uh, exoplasmic domain. The exoplasmic domain of the cargo receptor picks up the cargo. What would be a good example of a cargo leaving the ER destined for somewhere else? There's just thousands of them. What's a good example? Something that needs to go, for example, an easy <laughs> guess would be something soluble that's going to leave the cell. Oh. 
perfect um, transigen. Could, could be an enzyme, right? So enzymes need to do that. So that would be a good cargo. So the cargo is going to be uh, attached to the cargo receptor. So the, the cargo is soluble in the ER exoplasmic compartment. And so that's why the cargo receptor has to bridge the entire membrane so that it can be recognized by the by SEC24 and become part of the coding process. Okay, so we've got these held on, and so there's one more layer of coats, because remember, this is an entirely different coding process. This is COP2 coding, not CLAFR. So we're going to form this lattice. It looks a little bit like a soccer ball, but it's not. It's a different geometry. So we need to have the sec, this last component. The outer layer is called SEC. 1331. And so if we recruit that, then we've got the whole thing starting to polymerize, and this will butt off into the vessel. That's all we have to do. So one of the roles that SEC 20, this, so far we have two roles, right? SEC 2324 has got to bind the SAR one, it's got to recognize the cargo, and then it's got to recruit SEC 1331. So when it does that, SEC 1331 forms the lattice that completes the coat, and so you form this ball, right? And when it comes off the membrane, what has to happen first? You form the coated vesicle, what's the first thing that has to happen? Take off the coat. You gotta fall apart, right? Because you have to deploy the targeting infusion complex to get you where you're going, okay? So we gotta unpeel this thing. Now the way this happens is, SEC 20, all we have to do is to get SAR1 to split its GTP and everything will unpeel. All right, that's, so that's the target. But how do you do this? Well, this needs a GAP protein. But guess what? The GAP protein for, SEC, for SAR1 is SEC 23. <laughs> but it's inactive until this coat forms. So the thing that activates the GAP activity of SEC 23 is this thing. So this is the, the gap activating protein that activates the gap activity of SEC23, which then causes SAR1 to split its GTP. So it's got three different proteins that have to talk to one another. And when that happens, this is going to split its GTP, and it will leave this little group of proteins and everything will fall apart. Yeah? So the formation of the cage causes the breakdown of the cage. Absolutely. And that makes a lot of sense, because once you form the little bud, and then you've got the form of vesicle, you don't want it anymore. In fact, you, you can't have it. It has to. So that's kind of nice to build in the uncoupling process as part of the budding process. Okay. All right. Did I lose anybody, or are there questions about this far? Okay. So let's... Uh, Let's do a couple of exercises. Actually, not related to that. Oh, by the way, the, the test material stays the same. I'm not changing the test material. So, this would not be a test question. Okay. Uh, So let's, let's stop talking. We got to work on this. is a long problem, so let's get, get to it. Get this out of the way.
up here so you can see. So pick something. <coughs> Okay, so uh, looks like most people, just a third of the class thinks it's answer one and everybody else is sort of all over the place. All right, so, so turn to your uh, um, classmates and, and try this again. Your group members. And so this tells you that it's positively charged uh, residues are on the N-terminal side of that alpha helix, closer to the N-terminus. And what happens is anything that's adjacent to those, those positively charged uh, residues is going to end up in the cytoplasm. So that means that the N-terminal portion of that protein is in the cytoplasm. So if you just draw it out, you won't make a mistake. Put the N-terminus, just put in with a line and then alpha helix and then C and then put the charges and force yourself to look at that and then you put the, the protein into the membrane, you won't get it wrong. Okay. 
Good. All right, so let's see if I can make this go. Okay, let's try it. One more. In fact, if you can see it, it's kind of hard.
because there is two types of ways that, that eight, the assembly part is standing on the plasma rubber. One, it's holding on to PIP2, so it's directly grabbing on to the surface of the cytoplasmic leaflet. Right? Um, and the second way is it's holding on to ARF, so it's got a direct binding to ARF. And also, it's holding on to the cargo receptor, which is a transmembrane protein. So it's got all kinds of proteins that it's um, indirectly holding on to, as well as directly holding on to. So it is both. Okay. Uh, and it needs that structure because it's, it's got to hold everything together. So it better have a good grip on the membrane. Okay. So let's go, go ahead and go forward since we're all together. So we've got this. Uncoated vesicle, and let's say it's coming off the. Uh, let's make it dock with uh, the plasma membrane. Okay, and so what we need is a targeting infusion complex, something to target and something to cause fusion. And we've uncoated it, so we can now we've now deployed these proteins so that are sticking out and can interact with other proteins. So one of the main players is another GTPAs, small GTPAs. Okay. And that group of proteins is called RAB, RAB. And what RAB does is it helps recruit proteins needed for the targeting and fusion complex. And one of those groups of proteins are the V snares and the T snares. So on the, the vesicle membrane, it's got one set of proteins. And on the target membrane, it's got another set of proteins. And these are going to have to fuse together somehow. So T snares and, and V snares. Also, it's got to interact with tethering proteins. Okay. Anybody ever play tetherball? You know, yeah. out there on the beach. You know, maybe you did this weekend. I don't know. Uh, and so you have this long thing with a, a volleyball, and you try, try to hit people in the face with it. Kind of swinging around. <laughs> okay. You know, get yourself in the sand. So you have this long thing. So what happens is these tethering proteins are actually are sort of long distance interactors. So there's actually tethering proteins coming out of the vesicle and tethering proteins coming out of the target. Now, let's, let's take an example. Um, in the ER, if you were a protein coming from the ER, you would have a protein called P115. That's a tethering protein. It's in the uh, vesicle that just butted off from the ER. And it, where's it headed? If it's coming from the ER, it's got to be going one place. To the Golgi. So in the Golgi membrane, in the cis-Golgi network, is another tether like this in the target membrane sticking out. And it's called, oddly enough, Golgians. They're called Golgians. And so P115 P150, interacts with the Golgians, and they snare each other. Okay? They, they grab on each other. And what that does is it brings it close enough so the V-snare and the T-snare can come together. What gets all those proteins to, to go in the right spot? That's what RAB does. Okay? And RAB is kind of like ARF and SAR because it has retractable landing gear. Right? So RAB in the GDP state is floating around in the cytoplasm. Right? And then when it bumps into its GEF, it's going to um, lose GDP and pick up GTP and deploy its landing gear. And its landing gear is actually, let's see if we have a good yeah, view of it, is an amphipathic helix and a uh, isoprenal group. So it's got two little ways of sticking into the cytoplasmic leaflet, but only into the cytoplasmic leaflet. Okay? So it bumps into its, its rab geth, okay? And there's different rabs depending on where you're going to go. So now we're getting even more specific. Depending on where you're going to go, you have to choose the right RAB to do it. Right? So in this case, uh, this is RAB5. And so what does that mean? We're, we're headed for either one of these two places that RAB5s will take you. Okay? And what happens is it sits down here and it recruits the proteins that need to come together. One of those things is the enzyme that we talked about earlier that you're going to need to change the phosphorylation state of the lipids. So PI3 kinase is a phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase. It's going to put a phosphate group at the 3 position on phosphatidyl inositol. Right? And if you needed to put it on a different place, you would recruit a different uh, enzyme. So this is 
This is considered a RAB effector. RAB is grabbing that protein and making it do something by changing the phosphorylation state. And then it recruits the tethering proteins. The RAB recruits tethering proteins. That's also a RAB effector. So phospholipid modifying enzymes, tethering proteins, and actually motor proteins. Because what we're going to do is take this vesicle uh, and we're not just going to let it float around. We're going to attach it to a motor protein and drive it along the cytoskeleton to its destination. So it's not diffusing. It's moving. It's being moved uh, in a directional sense. OK, so those are all examples of RAB effectors. And if we get it close enough, what's going to happen is the V-snare is going to interact with the T-snare and form this little really um, tightly knit complex. So let's look at an example. So let's say we've got everybody close enough to the target membrane, and then we're going to form this guy right here. Okay. And I think that's shown here. Okay. And this has been best studied in two types of situations. One is the synaptic vesicle inside of an axon terminal that's carrying a neurotransmitter, like acetylcholate. So you remember that, that axons innervate muscle, correct? And what you have to do is release acetylcholine into the synapse, and then it's going to bind to what? The nicotinic receptor. So you should know that, right? So how do you get this synaptic vesicle in the axon cytoplasm to fuse with the plasma membrane? How do you do it? Well, you use your RAB to get it close enough so it's tethered, and then the T-snare and the V-snare needs to come together. So the V-snare has a very uh, specific name. It's called synaptobrevin. And notice everything has a syn or a synapse name to it because of where you are. So the V-snare is in the vesicle, synaptobrevin, and then there are two proteins that you need to beat T-snares, okay? Uh, syntaxin, and then this, this protein called SNAP25. So both of these are T-snares. Now here's the rule. You've got to have four alpha helices to form this. This is a four helix bundle. And it needs to be very, very stable. Okay? One of the helices is contributed by the V-snare, and three of the helices are contributed by the T-snares. And when they link together, this is going to form a really tight grip. Okay? All right, so let's go to this situation. So here's this incoming vesicle. Why doesn't it fuse right away? Well, what it's waiting on is a signal, a calcium signal. Okay? So what's happening is this protein here, synaptotaglin, is interfering with the formation of the four helix bundle until calcium shows up. So the reason you're not fusing your acetylcholine vesicles all the time with the plasma membrane is because it's prevented by synaptotaglin. Synaptotaglin is waiting for the correct signal. What's the correct signal? An action potential comes down the plasma membrane, changes the voltage that's perceived by the, this is a voltage gated calcium channel, and so it depolarizes the membrane. Calcium then floods in here, it opens, right? Calcium floods in here, binds the synaptotagmin, and this thing gets the heck out of town. It leaves, it moves out of the way, and the four helix bundles <laughs> snare together. The V snare and the T snares form these. And there's not just one of these, they form, let's go over here. If there's a whole little stitch all the way around the vesicle, then what happens is progressively it squeezes all, you have to get out all the water and make this completely hydrophobic. And when it does, the membrane will spontaneously fuse together. So you have to exclude water by forming that tight seal of the snake. Okay. Now let's go back here. Um, what Botox does, is you give somebody a patient Botox, what Botox does is from, it's the toxin from Clostridium botulinum. And what Botox does, it comes in here and it cuts synaptobrevin. And if you cut synaptobrevin, the V-snare is no longer part of the picture. This can't fuse, and you can't release acetylcholine and contract the skeletal muscles in your face. And so you don't have a wrinkle anymore, because wrinkles are caused by the skeletal muscles contracting in your face. And so that's the way Botox works. It, it cuts that V snare, and so this thing cannot fuse. Okay. All right, 
The other uh, situation that's medically related um, is, oh, okay, let's finish the story. So once this docks here, and the, the, the formal term for docking is when you form the, the t snare d snare full helix bundle. Okay. And so you form a, a zipper all the way around, it fuses, and the whatever the contents in here are, ex are expelled to the exoplasmic compartment. But if you have a membrane protein that's in the vesicle, say like GLUT4, it's actually delivered into the target membrane. And so we're going to want to do that here in a few moments. But the other thing, so this four helix bundle is extremely stable, and we want to be able to reuse it. So what we have to do is untwist it. And what untwists it are a few accessory proteins, and this protein here. This is not the National Science Foundation. It's n ethylmalamide sensitive factor, since you're asking. And that's in your notes, but you can call it an SF. NSF is like a heat shock protein. It's an AT and it helps unwind these stable proteins apart so that they can be reused. So that's what NSF does. <laughs> OK. Now, here's the other place where this has been studied exhaustively. And this is in skeletal muscle, which is the major consumer of blood glucose. And in order to get glucose to come into muscle cells, you have to have a special glute molecule, which you know now is GLUT4. And what happens is those vesicles containing GLUT4 sit there waiting to be told when to fuse with the plasma membrane. You don't want your muscle pulling all the glucose into the cell. You want to wait until insulin tells you to do it. So what happens is insulin binds to the cell, and we're going to get into that end of it here in a couple of weeks, but insulin tells the muscle cell to deploy this vesicle and fuse it with the plasma membrane. Okay. And so the key players are the T snares and the D snares. And we're not going to learn all of these proteins. Okay, we'll, we'll, do, we'll learn some of them later. Okay, but what ha here's the key thing. So this is the cargo, this is the GLUT4. And remember, I said if you have a transmembrane protein and this vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, where is that protein going? Into the plasma membrane. It's going to be delivered. All right, so all we have to do is get this vesicle to fuse with the plasma membrane. And so the V snare is FAMP2, vesicle associated membrane protein 2. The T snare is two things. One of them is called syntaxin, and that's that little black thing right there. And then SNAP23 is right there. And so if you can get those two to pair up, this will fuse. But there's all these inhibitory proteins that I don't need for you to memorize that are in the way until insulin says it's good to do this. So what insulin is going to do is tell the muscle cell, using a complicated jiggery pokery mechanism here, to get rid of these proteins through phosphorylation and several other interactions. So this is like the synaptotagmin was. It's the blockers that's preventing this from happening. And if you can get rid of these guys, they could disappear then this will fuse with the plasma membrane and you will deliver glut 4 and suck glucose out of your bloodstream into your skeletal muscle and your blood glucose will fall. Okay. Now, uh, it's been found that um, people with particular type 2 diabetes uh, become insulin insensitive. They can secrete insulin, but they, they're not sensitive to it. And one of the reasons, they're not, there's several different reasons that they become insensitive is that they start to store so much fat that their adipose tissue can't handle it, and so they store it in inappropriate places. Liver, skeletal muscle, and the beta cell itself. You're not supposed to store fat there. And if you do, what happens is you form lipid droplets in muscle cell. And that lipid droplet actually recruits SNAP23 from the plasma membrane to the liver droplet. And so you pull it off the cell membrane, and look, you're depleting the plasma membrane with the machinery you need to fuse the GLUT4 vesicle. So if you deplete this membrane of SNAP23, you cannot absorb glucose because the, the targeting mechanism is blocked. So if you mess with any of these targeting mechanisms in any of these situations, you're going to mess up what's going on. And so. Um, there really is a lot of clinical um, significance to all of these pieces. It's, I know it seems detailed, but there's a reason that we have studied this. Okay, questions about the system? We're going to learn how this part works a little bit later when we talk about signal transduction.
Okay. Uh, let's take a real brief four-minute break because we've already had some questions today. And then we'll go on. <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead and get started again. So now we we need to start spending some time between the ER, the Golgi trafficking. We've done one way, you know, with COP2, but there's actually reverse trafficking, and we got to really form this Golgi and take a good look at it because it's a big, very important trafficking. Um, okay, so. What's happening, we use COP2 coding mechanisms to actually form the, sorry, the, the Cis-Golgi network. And so this is a little confusing. What's happening is these vesicles are budding off, and then they're undergoing what's called homotypic fusion. That is, each vesicle has the same set of G snares and D snares. And so that's shown somewhere. Yeah, here we go. So what's happening is those little vesicles are actually coalescing to form a new compartment, which is called, very clumsily, vesicular tubular clusters. And then the tubules fuse, and then you finally, what you end up with is you get the cis network. So really, the cis network is being fused, is being formed by the coalescence of all these vesicles. And they all have the same set of T-snares and B-snares, and when that happens, that's called homotypic fusion. Now what we just looked at in the synapse and with the muscle cell, that's called heterotypic because the uh, vesicle and the dome and the uh, target compartment have different sets of proteins. So that's heterotypic fusion. And if you just want to form a bigger uh, compartment, you have homotypic fusion and you form this, this becomes tubular. And actually, although this looks simple, you actually have to have a series of proteins that make this, that deform the curvature so that it's not as round, okay? And so there are proteins that cause this to slim out and actually proteins that move this. And so you have to have motor proteins moving this from the ER to form the cis network. So this is a very dynamic structure. What's happening is these cisterni, these sacs of the Golgi, are always moving in one direction. They're moving from the cis network to the trans network. All right. So we'll come back to that issue. So if you're if you've got things moving this direction, what happens is sometimes you have cargos that aren't supposed to leave the ER. What is a good example of a soluble cargo that should not leave the ER? You want it, you want it to stay in the ER. One of the proteins that we talked about. Think of one of the several functions of the ER. What happens there? And then think about the proteins that do that. So going back to day one, is a protein any good if you don't fold it? No, you've got to fold it. And it folds in the ER. And what's the protein that helps fold the protein? That's a good example, BIP. Okay, so BIP, what if BIP gets in here and wants to leave the cell? He's just going to go and spring break all the way up, you know? He's not going to stop until he gets to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so we don't want that to happen, so we need to retrieve stuff going back this way. So we need to use a different vesicle coding mechanism, and that coding mechanism is called COP1. So you want, when you go in the retrograde from the Golgi back to the ER, you use COP1. When you go anterograde to the Golgi, that's COP2. And so we're not going to go and learn all the, the different proteins for COP1 because it's pretty similar and there's no need to memorize it. Okay, so as long as you understand this mechanism, understand that COP1 is very similar, but you're going in the, a different direction. And we'll leave it at that. Okay? So again, though, we have to figure out what, what's the mechanism to retrieve BIP from here. Right? So what's going to happen is if you're a soluble ER protein and you're supposed to stay there, you need to listen to one radio station, and that radio station is KL. Okay? That's the C-terminus for amino acid sequence on all resident ER proteins. It's KL, all right? And there's a KL, guess what? There's a transmitter on the radio, there's a KL receptor, right? And so that's a transmembrane alpha helix. 
got to span the membrane because remember, all cargo receptors have to have at least one alpha helix that spans the membrane. And so the KDL receptor will recognize that BIP has a KDL sequence and it will bind to it. And because it's a cargo receptor of a specific type, it's a KDL cargo, uh, it's a KDL receptor, it recruits not COP2, but COP1 because it needs to go back to the ER. So the recruiting mechanism determines the direction of where this cargo is going to go. And so the COP1 coding forms, it buds off of this vesicle, even as it forms these vesiculotubular clusters and before it can even get there. And so there's a re constant retrieval of proteins that don't belong here. All right? So it's not that you stop outward traffic, it's always, you always bring it back the correct uh, cargo. All right, so it's kind of cool. All right, so you have this whole uh, retrieval system. You've got the COP1 retrieval going backwards and backwards. And also you can use COP1 to transfer cargos between the, the, the Golgi stacks. These are called Golgi cisterna, right? Cisterni is, is plural. Each sack is a cisterna. And so these sacs all have very standard mechanisms of what they do. They add certain types of glucose here and glycosylate there and do something here and there. So they have different roles. So you want the stuff, the enzymes in the cisterna to always be standard. So you're always removing things because the sac, all these sacs are moving forward continuously along the uh, cytoskeleton. Okay, we have to go to Okay, so that forms this fairly complicated structure, which we know is the Golgi apparatus. And remember, the rule is the cis phase is always pointing towards the ER and the nucleus. The trans phase um, is pointing towards the plasma membrane. And both the cis and the trans faces are very bubbly, so we call them networks. Because there's lots of vesicles fusing with this phase and lots of vesicles that are forming from that phase. All right, so these are the names, um, and this is a nice EM picture showing that which side faces the nucleus and, and the other side, all right? And um, we're not going to memorize all these different things. We're going to learn a couple of different things that go in each of these compartments. But the key take-home message is different enzymes live in different compartments, okay? You can isolate these by differential centrifugation and actually pinpoint the enzyme that belongs in the cis-Golgi the medial Golgi, the trans Golgi, and the trans Golgi network. And then once you get to the trans Golgi network, this gets all bubbly because you're going to send things to various targets, to the lysosome, plasma membrane, and secretory vesicle. Okay? All right, so that's the goal. And how do you form the, the, the Golgi itself? Well, there, there's two ideas. This is called the vesicular transport model. And what, it's an older idea, but it's still got some supporters as, until they die. Uh, they'll give up their idea. But eventually, what, so originally we thought that the Golgi stacks stood still. That they were attached to matrix proteins and they just stood there. And what happens is, to get traffic to go forward, you had to form a vesicle and go to the next stack. And then bud another vesicle and do another one and do another one. The problem with that is, how do you get a large cargo, like a large collagen protein, to go forward? There's not enough space in these little vesicles. They calculate it. Okay. So somebody said, well, what's happening is the cisterna are actually moving forward, not the contents. And what's happening is each of these cisterna are actually hitching a ride of motor proteins attached to the, the cytoskeleton. So, the uh, microtubules are, uh, are underlying this cisterna, right? And they're moving along a series of moving tracks attached to motor protein. So this makes this very dynamic. But if you move this sac to here, which would be the, this is the cis-Golgi network to the cis-Golgi cis, uh, cisterna right there, um, this has to have a set of enzymes that's different from that. So how do you get these enzymes to go back here? Well, you send them backwards by a COP1 coated vesicle. 
So this is the cisternal maturation model, which is more accepted now. What happens is the cisterna move, and to get to, to maintain the constant function in each one of these cisterna, you're shipping the enzymes backwards as it moves forwards. So what happens is you always maintain the same enzyme population in each cisterna. So we think this cisternal maturation mo uh, model works the best. The way you exchange any kind of protein between the cisterna is through COP1 coded vessel. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll get it. We'll stop there and we'll pick this up on Thursday.